CME. The International Ventromacular Traction Study Group, they showed it is probably a defect in the inner fovea with irregular contour, intraretinal splitting, and mostly intact photoreceptor layer. The pathogenesis is more primarily is because related to the PVD, and secondary because of this unroofed CME, end stage ARMD, MACTIL type 2, solar retinopathy, tamoxifen retinopathy, as well as partial closure of the full thickness macular hole. A few definitions are important before, before we go into this lamellar hole epiretinal proliferation. So epiretinal membrane, as we all know, it's irregular and hyperreflective layer of over the ILM with signs of wrinkling of the underlying retina and hyperreflective spaces between the ARM and the ILM. Where the epiretinal proliferation is a thick, homogeneous, and isoreflective, fully adherent layer over ILM with no hyperreflective spaces between the membrane and the ILM. The third one is the ERM phobioschisis. These are the level of the Henle's layer, where we have microcystoid spaces in the inner nuclear layer. Retinal thickening is there, and there is wrinkling. And the fourth one is the macular pseudo hole, where you have a phobial sparing, uh, central sparing ERM, verticalized or stipend phobial profile, and normal uh, central phobial thickness. So this is one which is a typical epiretinal uh, membrane, where you have a uh, membrane. There are some uh, spaces, space in between the retina and the membrane compared to the epiretinal proliferation where you don't have much gap in between the membrane and the ILM. So these are the two definitions which is being studied uh, extensively. There's there are different nomenclature on that. So one, the first group is the ERM, the tractional ERM component where you have irregular hyperreflective layer attached to the intermittently to the retina compared to the thick homogeneous material. We call it either thick ERM, dense ERM or thicker ERM or LHEP where you have a thick homogeneous material of medium reflectivity universally adherent to the retina and there is no traction. So definitely we have a different approach to this. The first component is tractional lamellar macular hole where we have a typical ERM and the degenerative lamellar macular hole where you have some photoreceptor abnormality also if you see in the lower picture uh, we have a degenerative lamellar macular hole where there is a presence of adherent epiretinal proliferation. It's very difficult to distinguish the membrane from the ILM. So the epiretinal proliferation is a hallmark of this LHEP where we have seen uh, the derived, which is actually derived from the molar cells. We have RP proliferation and migration through, through the defects. Usually have they have a lower visual acuity because of the photoreceptor disruption and rarely the distraction. And if you see this picture, clearly shoe is seen intraoperatively, is derived from the carotenoids and epiretinal proliferation was present in 26% eyes in patients who actually had a full thickness macular hole surgery. So when to plan surgery is in LHEP, where you have already uh, disturbed vision. Though there are certain indications on that. You have a prominent ERM, less symptomatic, but uh, patient is having mild distortion. 60% of these patients are associated with thick membrane and CME with a significant distortion. These are indicative. Surgery who have progressive disabling visual loss and increased in ellipsoid zone disruption, they also fall into this category and in patients who have a less than 20 by 40 vision with evidence of ERM. But only thing we have to keep in mind is these studies also have told that cataract can be a confounding factor in these patients where there was visual gain after the surgery. So LHEP progression also, if you see this patient who has been operated, uh, there was a lamellar uh, uh, LHEP with a lamellar hole, epiretinal proliferation progressed to a full thickness macular hole. Even after surgery, you have a small neurosensory defect. So in proportion of eyes which had fail has an anatomical progression was 13 to 20, 13 to 21 percent after two years of follow-up, going up to 33 percent after 8.3 years. The surgical technique is usually a standard three-port vitrectomy with IVT-assisted PVD induction. A diamond-dusted silicon tip or bend 25 gauge MVR is engaged is in, uh, used to engage the LHEP tip at the periphery after uh, staining. Sticky LHEP peeling started by engaging the ILM forceps, which is not occupied by ERM, is an easier technique to tackle this membrane. There are few propositions about embedding the LHEP into the retinal cleavage with very good pr uh, surgical outcome. And modest LC, they also advocated leaving the intact ILM, so around two this diameter, or the phobial sparing technique for these conditions. There are few uh, people who proposed not to have a trimming of LHEP, uh, probably advocated trimming of LHEP around the whole margin with scissors and keeping a uh, flap over the LMH. These are different techniques which is being published. Uh, this is one from uh, the Disha group where they had also had a mo modified surgical technique of uh, embedding the flap. So this is the membrane embedding technique 
where the first one you can see the uh, LM uh, is being actually started, then followed by the ERM, which is being both embedded over the lamellar macular hole. So this one uh, patient uh, who had actually had a flat membrane, you can see we do a vitrectomy and pivot induction, followed by uh, staining, brilliant blue staining. You can see here negative LATP staining here because of the membrane, and we start removing the membrane uh, first around the ILM flap so that you can actually get into the membrane. We make a flap of the ARM over this. A few, few things you have to keep in mind because there are a lot of appendages here. So you have to be very careful while you sta start removing the membrane. The first flap is the epiretinal flap, which you keep around the phobia. After that, you start, uh, you uh, do a staining again. So multiple times staining is important for this type of surgeries where you can actually have different layers coming coming together. I, now you can see a very good stained ILM. Now you start making the ILM flap. So you don't deroof the ERM and you don't deroof the ILM also. So you just uh, do what you actually do in inverse flap. You keep make a flap, ILM flap, circumferential ILM flap, and you once it is freed from the peripheral ILM, you embed it over the lamellar macular hole. And then you circumferentially further peel the ILM as we are normally do in any other macular hole surgeries to remove the peripheral traction. So we are trimming the peripheral ILM. These patients uh, uh, need a full FG and full gas. Uh, this is by your soft tip, you can just embed the ERM ILM flap over the LMH. Full gas, and uh, these are the comparisons where you see LMH without LHEP, with maintained ellipsoid zone, post vitrectomy, where UR removal and ILM peeling is there. This patient, you even you can see here, there is no photoreceptor defect. Uh, this is a typical tractional ERM. Compared to this life side, where you can see a lamellar hole, epiretinal proliferation, significant photoreceptor, uh, uh, inoretinal defect, photoreceptor defects here. And even after uh, one year of following surgery, the visual acuity was not significantly improved compared to a normal ERM. So the surgical difficulties what we face in this LMH with LHEP with altered ellipsoid zone. These are the yellow arrows with dotted lines where we can see the LHEP. So the first one is it's elastic and friable, which is difficult to peel. LHEP peeling for degenerative LMH can lead to macular thinning and even full thickness macular hole. And dense epiretinal proliferation have a yellow, dense, fluffy appearance. Sometimes it becomes very difficult to distinguish while removal. These are a few meta-analysis. Uh, this is meta-analysis meta about the comparison of uh, surgeries where they have done without LHEP and with LHEP uh, epiretinal membrane. And this was the apparent uh, surgical outcome. So BCV recovery in LHEP patients was less compared to the patients without LHEP. So this has to be very uh, kept in mind. LHEP might be a part of the recovery process of a LMH. Double inverted ELM, ERM as well as ILM can preserve LHEP and promote LMH recovery. Despite low visual acuity, thinner CFT and disrupted ellipsoid zone, 50 to 79% patients of LHEP had a normal phobial contour, restored, which was reported in our 19 papers. So that is one thing which probably is a positive outcome from this surgery. Eyes with LMH and LHEP, where we have seen a reduction of the IOSOS defects in patients with LHEP, which was more compared to patients without LHEP because photoreceptor abnormality was less in the second group. So to conclude, most of the LMH proliferation with minimal visual complaints can be observed. Though LMH LHEP carries a poor prognosis, surgery is advocated if there is increasing metamorphopsia and decreasing vision. Pre-op OCT biomarkers are helpful to counsel a patient in LHEP because they sometimes can have not suboptimal visual acu uh, acuity recovery and they need a very serial follow-up too. Newer modifications in surgery of LHEP are showing promising anatomical and functional results. So thank you so much for your patient hearing. So I would uh, uh, request uh, audience uh, if you have any questions regarding this uh, specific talk or otherwise I'll call the second speaker. I request Dr. Anirudh Maiti.
So Dr. Maithi will be having talk on myopic, uh, on macular hole surgery in different situations. We have few reshuffling of these talks because of uh, concomitant ICs in other rooms. So Tony, Dr. Maithi, please. So how, how is this uh, visual acuity? You have shown this meta-analysis as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is your experience of uh, this LHEPVT RME? I, uh, I feel that uh, most of the time if the patient is symptomatic, they have uh, definitely has improved. But the visual acuity improvement, what we get in normal, typical ERM surgery was not that good. But patients were symptomatically better. Distortions, metamorphopsia was not uh, that much. But what we usually get in conventional normal ERM surgeries. So this is more helpful for those who are symptomatic yes. patients. But photoreceptor abnormality was much less compared to what uh, pre-operative, post-operative, yeah, non it was normal, it was not normalized. Thank you, uh, Shudip, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Well, I will be showing uh, macular hole in different scenarios, starting from simple macular hole to large macular hole, macular hole with ERM, macular hole with detachment. So to start with, so the macular hole in different scenarios, the simple macular hole. In a simple macular hole, just uh, we do an vitrectomy. What is important is we need to do a very good staining with the BVG. And obviously the visibility is very important and nowadays with this uh, viewing system, especially the recite as well as the biome and the high magnification lens, we can, we can pretty well make out the ILM. So when we are peeling, it's better to peel as much as possible because Whenever there is a recurrence, we need to repeal. So why not in the first go? So this is like an, a large macular hole. And this was associated with epiretinal membrane as well. We can see the sediments of triamcillinol sitting on the ERM. So we are removing the ERM and ILM complex in total. And now we can see the macular hole, which is quite a large one. Uh, there is various uh, methods. This is one of them where we actually drain the macular hole uh, from the edges of the macular hole and as well as a little bit of massaging. Yeah, that's uh, sometimes uh, there is a little bit controversial because it might injure the underlying RP. Uh, I think the better method is a inverted flap technique, which I think we are doing very regularly because we do get li large macular hole most of the time we don't get simple macular hole. So just till the ILM, keep it over the macular hole, which forms a scaffold on which the neural tissue grow and the macular hole closes. And once you have done, once you have done it, then you increase the ILM pill area. The results are pretty much good with this invert inverted flap technique. And whenever the hole is more than 500 to 600, it is better to go ahead with this inverted flap technique. 
which we have seen in the many review of literature. So what I was mentioning, I, I try to do fill as much as possible. Now sometimes uh, in an inverted flap technique, uh, what you plan doesn't happen. Like uh, you plan to get the flap over the macular hole, but sometimes the flaps actually come on eccentrically, not over the macular hole. Then you need to do some modification. So once we were actually in the process of doing a inverted flap, and now we can see one edge, the ILM has dislodged. And the ILM flap is actually on the other side, not really over the macular hole. So to make the ILM flap on the macular hole, what we do, a simple modification of putting some visco on the, after doing a uh, fluid air exchange, you put some visco over and just manipulate the ILM over the macular hole. And it actually gives a very good, pretty good results. Now macular hole with retinal detachment, this is one of the most difficult peeling. Uh, sometimes we were able to do an ILM peeling without putting PFCL, without stabilizing the posterior pole. But it's always better to stabilize once you get a flap of the ILM and then put PFCL, stabilize the posterior pole and finish the ILM peeling part. That's what we are doing. We have peeled a part, so uh, the flap is already there from where we need to initiate the ILM peeling. And at the same time, we are stabilizing so that the peeling becomes easier. Now the peeling is much easier because our posterior pole is stabilized. Yeah, it's done. And coming to the last scenario where we get a uh, failed macular hole. There are also various methods we can do a free flap. Uh, sometimes, like in this case where we have not done the primary case, primary surgery, uh, we should always stain and see how much peeling has actually been done. So if you see that it is not done from arcade to arcade, this is what we can do. Uh, do a repealing and do a very good fluid air exchange with gas tamponade. Many a case actually, you can do a fluid air exchange again and the macular hole closes. This is where we have done and peeling from arcade to arcade and actually it gave good result. Obviously, considering the size of the macular hole, it didn't do a type one closure. There was a type two closure in this case. Now we have done almost arcade to arcade peeling. And obviously the fluid ear exchange in this kind of cases are very important with gas tamponade and instructing the patient to maintain prone position. A little bit of massaging also helps. So to conclude, recent advances, MIVS and the membrane dyings has made macular surgeries more predictable and obviously with the improved outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maiti. I think we have a few uh, near, uh, very young retinal surgeons here. Probably they will on, uh, uh, come to want to know that how do you uh, prevent slippage of these edges of ILM when you plan a inverse flap technique? Or maybe in the beginning, what are the specific things you want to tell for these young people who will be starting inverse flap technique? 
I think uh, you need to start the peeling where it is stained pretty well because that is a very key thing with your starting should be very good. You have to have a very good control over the ILM peeling because yeah. here you are not doing yeah. the peeling in total. So, so wherever it is stained well, you start from there and make sure you are not going in, in, a, in a go and just uh, taking the ILM off. You have to keep the ILM the at the edge of the macular hole. Yeah. And it's always better to have a multi-layered uh, ILM peeling flap, yeah. uh, so that if some flap is dislodged, the other flap will take uh, will compensate for that and it, it gives a good result. Instead that of a single flap, the multi-layered flap. Yeah, that's what's called the onion peel technique. Yeah. Yeah. And in cases of RD with macular hole, always start from nasal to Yeah, that is, to that is true. A, uh, hinge of yeah. the optic disc in fact this way. case also we started in the nasal side but it didn't happen so this is also true that it has to be started where the staining is good the nasal side we didn't have any stain and it was very difficult to do another thing is recently there had been some articles which are showing that uh, in most of these recurrent macular holes the 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 trans the disposition of the holes they are basically uh, oval horizontally so now a new concept is coming out. It's not the way you new. pull the. Uh, no, it's like uh, if you when you are peeling, you peel more than two disc diameters on the temporal side, because that is where you need the relaxation more. Because these recurrent macular holes tend to be uh, horizontally oval. Dhananjay Shukla and group they are uh, the proponents of this theory where they are saying that you uh, go arcade to arcade in the other areas, but you peel a little more in the temporal side so that the, it gets more relaxed. So why not peel the entire area? Yeah, of course. <laughs> if you peel the entire yeah. area, that's because fine. In any case, when you in go any case, inside yeah. for the next time, you are going to peel. Yeah. So peel it in the beginning as well. Right. And there is a concept, I think, many of us are practicing, inducing and retinal detachment beside a macular hole which actually so helps. Yeah. We have seen in a detachment with macular hole, actually hole closes very nicely it, it because the retina yeah. is mobilized. So because induce mobilized, a retinal yes. detachment with a 41 right. gauge needle and it helps in the hole closure. Now suppose we are planning for inverse flap technique, does the area of peeling matter? Good question. <laughs> we, I, ha I have thought this question many times. <laughs> But didn't take the risk of just doing the no, really don't area know. of macular I holes. I don't. I probably don't think the about it. probably probably so uh, probably Dr. Not. Nandi's question says the uh, probably no, but again probably yes because we don't know the answer. It is a multiple force which I is I playing a role. So in that particular case, how much is that frictional or how much is actually the addition between the retina and the uh, RP that is there? Uh, that is the reason you are you are asking about that inducing the P, uh, you know RD in the surrounding area. Yeah. So that is actually uh, playing a role. There is a horizontal traction is playing a role. The anteroposterior traction has already been taken care. So and uh, after going those flap inside the fibrosis which is taking place that also is causing to some extent of pulling those retina. So multiple factor are there. So you don't know he. But again I am sure that in inverse flap technique the failure rate is almost very very less true so th probably the idea is to make the ilm at least three foot free from the macular hole area so it should be hinged to one point only in yes. order to make maximum success of the inverse flap probably th i think so so you are asking about the size of the uh, peeled area or you are asking you whether it is a complete peeling has to be there in all the areas that complete peeling from the around the uh, macular hole area as if at the slight hinge should be there at one point. See, as a VR yeah, surgeon, I will be no, no, not comfortable of doing an incomplete peeling, even if I'm doing the inverse flap also. No, so you will peel from all sides, yes. but one point should be there at the attachment around the macular hole. Yeah, In and for, there, yes. Yes, yes. for so youngsters. The Otherwise, the f that will be as good as free flap. Yeah, for youngsters, that hinge should be on the temporal side. Like, uh, yeah. There is a technique there are where they do peel on the temporal the, side after only. After the invention of yeah. this don't peel in the nasal side. After, don't after peel the invention of the temporal hinge island flap, there are a lot of modifications happened uh, of JD Narvishkar uh, technique that uh, only temporal hinge, superior hinge, nasal hinge also, envelop technique, uh, just uh, in, engage inside the... Nowadays it is 
it is it has been like understood by all of us that only covering the macular hole with the flap is good yes. enough because that it is single flap or multiple flap envelope technique you have to cover the macular hole that, 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 that can, can be ILM scaffold. or anything else <laughs> yeah because we have to give the scaffold yes mm. yeah, or retina gas or no gas means gas no gas i am i am using air air is the simplest gas the gas is there no again again no, I think the question is that how long to not make any have a tampon? Because initial 70 70 72 hours enough. is the both SF6 and CGF. Yeah. See, the most important is here the size of the hole. See, if you have a very tiny hole of 200 micron size, yes. definitely with air itself it goes off. Or sometimes those who have described of non-gas technique or without vitrectomy gas injection, all of them are less than 400 cases. So all cases has been tried not for 400, 600 or all those cases. So less than 400 cases, probably whatever you do intervention, probably once you release the traction a little bit, it will close down. I think we'll uh, move on to, uh, in those conditions where we, when I, we couldn't seal the macular hole. So we'll have this innovative technique. We will learn from this technique from Rupa Kanti Dushas about how to do this grafting in these failed macular holes. Dr. Anirudh has described the all all type of you know uh, primary hole surgery, but even after that, also nightmare comes when you know uh, you don't have a complete success rate. So then uh, I always prefer to tell them that it is not the end of your you know thinking process, or pr probably that is the beginning of you can think in a different way. So this is a, a pre-recorded surgery, so I'll just play it off. So uh, I'll just keep on talking. So I'll just uh, talk. Uh, so once you do a like a standard peeling technique in 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 a uh, in a as a, as a, as a standard uh, macular hole surgery, but you can you can land up of having this is pre op and post op. So this much of having. So when when you have uh, you know a larger size of the hole, you always plan for you know pre operatively you always plan for this. Uh, inverse flap technique or envelope technique, but when you don't, w you have peeled enough, uh, you know that you have done. So you don't have uh, any other option other than you know doing this free flap and putting into there. So now the question comes: If you put only this free flap into that non-closed <laughs> hole, so what is the you know utility of putting that flap is there? So it causes fibrosis only on that uh, that area. And then SBOCT shows that there is an only scar is remaining. So we thought of, you know, why not to put, instead of putting the ILM itself, ILM cannot regenerate the retina as at that area. So why not to put the retina per se into that hole and see ki what is happening there. So for that we have devised a kind of a retinal trephine and then we preoperatively we measured the size of the macular hole, failed macular hole, and then predetermined the size of that and harvested a uh, autologous retinal graft just above the, uh, you know, so, uh, above this arcade and freed it with the help of a forceps and scissor. And then this part is being done under saline and then you do the fluid air actions. You can very well see the graft is, uh, you know, round shaped graft is there and you do the fluid air exchange with other hand and then place the graft there over that macular area and simply tuck it with your silicon tipped uh, cannula. Now the question here, the, now the main trick is here is you don't, you know, open your, uh, when you are doing it off, you don't open your, uh, you know, uh, port in that area so that otherwise this, this flap will come up. So and then donor site has been lasered successfully, the rest of the part of the fluid has been taken out. Now, yes, you have done the surgery successfully. Now, what, why, you, whether the retina has been closed or the, this hole has been, I mean, the hole has been closed properly? Yeah. So, yes, this is the success rate, what you can see. And you can see the earlier, I have shown this is a scar tissue, but here, the, the retinal architecture here is somewhat similar to uh, the other part of the retina. So, that is, that is, so whether this is an anatomical success, to know the uh, uh, success of this kind of cases, we did multifocal ERG and we have seen 
there's this much of spike what we are seeing in the macular area as well. And same time, we did 10-2, uh, central 10-2, because we don't have any uh, uh, microperimetry. So when we have seen this, these results are 25 to 26, 27, which is pretty good in the central macular area as well. So this is a uh, old record of almost near about uh, uh, two years back. So we have almost reached around 16 cases as of now. So all of them are having initial phases. We also had a learning curve and then we had a initial graft, reject, graft uh, uh, loss and uh, sub uh, retinal migration of the graft initial stages. But then when you realize that your graft size was not adequate and you increase the graft size of around 15% of what you got is an initial phase and then the success rate becomes absolutely almost 100% success rate. So there are different uh, surgeons have also tried of doing an autologous retinal transplant, but here the main difference is that the autologous retinal transplant was putting the, uh, the graft over this, over this area, which is bigger size of the, of the uh, hole. So, but compared to this, this is uh, here we are putting the exact size of the hole, putting the hypothesis that there is an aberrant regeneration takes place when a two cut nerve end comes together. So that's how is probably the, uh, uh, this is the reason that the central area, other than the anatomical success, this functional ability comes back. So, and we are not using any viscoelastic agent and not, no PFCL so that, you know, there is no hindrance between those two cut end, there is no substance in between. And if you see, this is, this is a normal um, MFERG this is uh, MFERG in a classically classic ILM peeling technique and closed macular hole. And this is ILM free flap has been put it here. And this is your graft. So if you see them in, 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 in one place, so this is a normal one. This is a classic peeling. This is a re-peeling and ILM plugging. And this is the grafting. That's what has been seen in, in, in one flap. So, uh, this is the collage of different cases of doing the similar kind of surgery. I know this is a uh, this is a probably not the beginning. There's a lot of people are doing this autologous retinal transplant in different part of the world, and uh, you know probably the autologous retinal transplant can give us the solution of lot of uh, diseases where there is exactly the tissue loss of the retina. This is this can be the way forward for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bishas. Uh, uh, do you have any questions from the audience? Uh, Dr. Bowell, have a question here. Uh, I did a uh, few of my cases, autologous retinal graft in uh, seven, eight cases, uh, where I uh, just uh, in a vitrectomy is done. So I first demarcate, do the demarcation uh, with the laser in the supranasal quadrant to avoid the post-operative ER information, first of all. Second is, uh, I'm just injecting the subretinal BSS just to make a blob-like elevation in using cautery to separate this. Uh, before that, I am putting my putting PFCL uh, up to beyond the uh, this harvesting area, donor site. Then uh, using the 26 X loop without holding the tissue with the forcep and another the PFCL with the 26 loop nicely in a controlled manner, you can just shift the graft to the macular area and do direct select uh, this uh, air uh, PFCL, uh, then do starting doing the FG, removing all the uh, fluid surrounding the PFCL bubble because it is a convex bubble, and doing direct silicon oil PFCL exchange on the sunless side. So this Why is not in gas? My gas you can put, but uh, oil, the success rate is maybe uh, high, that's why. Theoretically, gas should work much better than oil. Yes, but uh, sometimes uh, the like a patient may not cannot do the prone positioning. That's why the primary failure had happened. Yeah, I, so I, I think you, you have done all uh, the cases yeah. with gas. Yes. Yeah, so that is the main reason. No yes. uh, PFCL, no viscoelastic agent mm. over that area. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to there should not be any material coming into between the two cut end. So that's why you it is, it is uh, basically that's what we, what uh, we uh, wanted to look for. Uh, basically, in the year 2014-15, at that time also you have also started this technique. So uh, Dr. Uh, Tamir Mehmood and Dr. Uh, Dinraj Gewal, both of them, they did that in a two-stage manner. They used make the f uh, whole uh, vitreous cavity full of PFCL, and after two weeks, they are removing the PFCL 
injecting silicon and again they are doing all the silicon and that is a three stage procedure uh, you are telling it a single stage my is two stage yeah dr vishesh uh, uh, do you have a adjustable trephine how do you uh, do you have a pre op measurement you have, a, you have a series of different sizes of trephine adjustable trephine the main dif difficulty is that so if you need to do a trephination then you cannot have a sprong so adjustable trephine you will have a different sprongs which will can you know simply open up like this but the problem is that once you open up then the gap comes in between and once you have the gap you cannot rotate it like this and have an you know proper you know cut so that is the reason that you cannot have a sprong with this otherwise yes you can try we have tried doing a, a you know this kind of sprong also but it it does not give a that kind of a smooth cut like how you get it up with this uh, continuous trephine i think very nice videos uh We'll uh, move to the seg na seg uh, next talk with Dr. Shubhendu Boral. Dr. Mm. Shubhendu, you have. So most importantly, this video got the ASRS best video award. Also, Yuga Sinha best video award. Yes, so yes, yes. First prize, huh? Is it coming? So I think excellent technique uh, in excellent hands. Uh, so <laughs> we'll so have. Trifine, uh, the, the invention of Trifine is, I think, it has got the patent also, no? going <laughs> on it will take five years time it's india <laughs> so we have so uh, good afternoon everybody yes we'll have the next talk uh, by dr shubhendu boral uh -huh. with submacular hemorrhage submacular hemorrhage a lot of lyrimas a lot of uh, like uh, uh, permanent combination of uh, treatment we should know the what are the important etiologies is the neovascular amd pcp trauma and ruptured macronus there are four principal causes mm -hmm. and treatment strategies depends on the size of the hematoma duration of the blood and 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 distribution of the hemorrhage that is also important so let me tell you one thing less than one dx diameter submacular hemorrhage doesn't considered as a uh, submacular hemorrhage because it is a part of cnvm if it is uh, one to four dx diameter it uh, and less than four weeks uh, the small medium size and massive is the classification Plastic. given uh, described in survey of thermology that is small size less than two weeks anti or pneumatic displacement if it is traumatic in origin then it is suffices but it is more th it is more than four dx diameter but not extending the temporal vascular arcade and the duration is for two to four weeks so non-drainage produce procedure by uh, uh, vitrectomy along with this cocktail of subretinal tp anti vagab and air injection it is it is it is it is giving a good result but massive size hematoma more than four dx diameter and uh, beyond temporal vascular arcade more than four weeks drainage techniques are important where you have to do go for the subretinal TPA, retinotomy, and subretinal blood removal. And if it is uh, like uh, 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 you can do it either retinotomy or by the retin temporal retinectomy also. Or if it, I it is more than eight weeks, you can go for the RP for a correct patch graft transplantation as an added procedure. So ideal indication situation for subretinal hematoma, it is massive, thick, subfovial, predominantly inferior subretinal hemorrhage. And the tissue plus vena activator, which is present in our inside our eyes in uh, normally, it is in the aqueous humor, trabecular meshwork, lens, vitreous, conjunctiva, and commercially act it is available as a altiplase, retiplase, technitive place, which act on uh, that, uh, that activated plus venogen activator. It converts the plus venogen to plus venogen, which acts on fibrin to go for the fibrin de uh, degradation product. That's why it cause, uh, causes uh, clot lysis. Like just after giving the, uh, the, the, the subretinal TPA, you can see this kind of beautiful red colored happening uh, of the changing of color that happens in case of old, all any dark colored hemorrhage after uh, uh, subretinal TPA injection. And uh, just after giving air, this buoyancy factor that uh, has an upward action and this, uh, this gravity uh, of the uh, RBC that will go down. So that will make the fovea free of blood. So less than four weeks duration confined to the macular extending. Inferiorly in these cases, we are going for the subretinal TPA, anti vagab and subretinal air injection, and slow uh, one by one, you can see, and in this kind of situation, patient presented with, uh, with very poor vision, either finger counting or one feet vision, and uh, after giving this subretinal uh, anti uh, TPA, you go for the subretinal anti along with uh, sterile, uh, sterile uh, filtered air, so, uh, so that uh, it can sift the blood uh, inferiorly by its buoyancy factor and the rest of the lysed blood uh, due to the gravity, uh, gravity, uh, gravity action of the RBC uh, cells that will go down, that will make the fovea free of blood. 
Now, finally, you can see the fo uh, the post completely beautiful picture. Vision improves to six by twelve. But sometimes you are in dilemma whether it is vitreous hemorrhage along with subaortic hemorrhage or subretinal hemorrhage. You should go for the like to see the high reflective spikes from the anteretinal surface. That means, and there is subtly demarcated. You can see the yellow arrow. It is there. It is uh, it is arising from the optic nerve head. That means it is retina. It is not subaortic uh, hemorrhage, and. Like in this situation, patient presented with PLPR accurate vision, and the duration of the hemorrhage was four to eight weeks, extending beyond macula. So I planned for the cataract followed by vitrectomy, subretinal TP, and retinotomy. In this case, after doing the cataract and injecting IUL, uh, there was a lot of hemorrhage, and you can see the hemorrhage retinal detachment. Uh, so I planned for the subretinal TP injection for clot lysis. Now I did two retinotomies, one at the infront nasal and uh, one uh, to remove the blood remove the blood partially from the nasal side as much as possible followed by supratemporal area supratemporal area just sorry supratemporal area uh, uh, from the just above the temporal vascular arcade and remove the blood do the fluid exchange and uh, check uh, whether any residual subretinal blood is there or not uh, and do the laser and injected silicon oil at the end of surgery. So postoperatively, you'll see slowly, slowly there is uh, ear information uh, that happened after uh, after uh, uh, one uh, after three months of the surgery. So then I removed the oil and ear removal. You can see patient finally gained six by tw uh, twenty-four vision. This is another case of uh, uh, hemorrhage retinal detachment with lot of vitreous hemorrhage. You can see the blood is tenaciously uh, adhered to the underlying detached retina, and the whole retina is uh, it is it is almost in black colored. You can see the the blood is quite old it is uh, although it's uh, more than one month but fortunately it was less than eight weeks so i i did uh, subretinal tp injection and followed by waiting for 15 minutes time for the adequate clot lysis you can wait for a range of 10 to 50 45 minutes but uh, for the adequate clot lysis but in this situation uh, i waited for uh, 15 minutes and removed all the blood used pf cell to for the uh, drainage of settlement of retina and did the laser and followed by direct PFCL silicon oil exchange using uh, sandalus light, injecting PFCL, uh, injecting silicon oil with the left hand and removal of PFCL with the right hand. post you will get this kind of picture. So more than eight weeks, uh, that is much more RP is much more in a compromised situation. So when I, I, I did a temporal retinectomy, remove all blood along with the CNVM and uh, CNVM it is it is very much like it is very thick and you have to use the settings of just doing uh, uh, doing uh, like uh, removal of cataract with the setting of uh, that uh, 600 suction and 100 cutting rate and now I'm injecting subretinal PFCL because you can see the RP is quite uh, work quite compromised and to keep the retinal flap away from the, our working site then choose an area of relatively healthy looking site and used two for sep uh, uh, under the PFCL uh, by manually I am shifting the this uh, this uh, full thickness RP chloride graft uh, under the PFCL into the proposed site of the fovea and uh, graft alignment was done uh, underneath the uh, that uh, fovea's uh, area and remove the PFCL and then inject the PFCL again uh, the overlay over anterior to the retina to settle the retina and do laser all around uh, along with silicon and PFCL exchange. So uh, post you will get uh, this kind my uh, kind of picture. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boral. I uh, very nice videos, uh, very innovative techniques. Uh, do you have any uh, comments to be made from the audience? Anybody wants to have any question? I have one question to Boral, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, when you inject ear, whether the first case or second case, yeah. how much of ear you have injected? Yes, 0 0.03 cc. 0 0.03 cc. Uh, you should always take care about the regarding volume over the subretinal so space. So, what average. will be the volume of TPN and ear? TPA is 0 0.05 and uh, antiphasia is 0 0.05 and 0 0.03 uh, ear. That is good enough. And you inject by yourself or your assistant pushes uh, it? Basically, I made one new instrument that is micro VFC that I have submitted in the SRF. That uh, one ml syringe that will describe in the other uh, micro VFC uh, and okay. So I think the there are reports that is of injecting in normal VFC uh -huh. also uh -huh. when you keep the yes. pressure around five yes. millimeters. Yes. Yes. So we have fortunate to see two award-winning video. Yes.
so we'll uh, uh, go ahead with the next talk uh, by Dr. Shomen Mondol, and this will be a little difficult, the macular foreign body removal, and how we restore the anatomy in these patients. Dr. Mondol, please. Uh, very good uh, afternoon, and I would like to thank uh, Shudipto and AIOs for this opportunity. Uh, we all know that intraocular foreign bodies that are located near the macula have a high possibility of macular damage uh, even during removal because of the enlargement of the penetration site. There might be excessive fibrosis after surgery. There might be retinal attraction. And uh, th there are several uh, significant adverse effects. The most important uh, adverse effect is of uh, prognostic factor, adverse prognostic factor for final visual acuity is a location of a foreign body in the posterior pole. Now, uh, when to intervene? What is the timing of intervention? Ideally, an intraocular foreign body should be removed at the time of repair of the entry uh, site or soon afterwards because uh, inflammation caused by the intraocular foreign bodies may uh, uh, lead to rapid uh, s uh, fibrous capsule around the uh, foreign body and they might uh, make delayed surgical removal uh, very difficult. The wound, however, should be removed as, uh, I mean, should be closed as early as possible. But if we wait for s uh, seven to 10 days, sometimes it might be advantageous because um, uh, 23 or 25G trochida, uh, troca is difficult to insert with a low IOP. A sealed or repaired globe will allow better insertion and uh, there might be decreased risk of uh, uncontrollable hemorrhages. Now what are the surgical goals? Uh, number one, to clear the ocular media, removal of a cataractous lens, vitreous hemorrhage, to remove the vitreous scaffold from the scleral, uh, scleral laceration site, to remove the posterior haloid, to identify the tractional uh, and treat the uh, retinal breaks and detachment. So I would uh, like uh, to present a representative case uh, and then we can discuss about the surgical procedures in detail. Here, uh, the surgeon, uh, as we can see, the cornea has, the entry wound in the cornea has already been repaired. Lensectomy has been done to get a clear view in the posterior segment. Oops, I'm so sorry. Now, uh, the surgeon has entered on the vitreous cavity, considerable amount of vitreous hemorrhage that has been cleared. The surgery has been done by my co-instructor, Dr. Krishnandu. Now, the surgeon is approaching the impaction site. He has identified the foreign body and is trying to nudge the foreign body out of the site of impaction. There you can see the foreign body being nudged. Hemostasis is being achieved. As you can see, the foreign body was bang on the macula. So after assessing the size of the foreign body, he has uh, cleared a port of exit. He is using a magnet and the foreign body is out. He's further assessing the damage. A fluid air exchange is done. A very careful indentation of the peripheral uh, retina is done to see if there's any retinal breaks. If required, laser has to be done here. And oil will be injected. So let's go to the surgical approach in details. Vitrectomy and removal of intraocular foreign body by magnet or forceps. 
the best tool to uh, extract an iron found body would be a strong intraocular magnet. And uh, we would try to align in the longitudinal axis of the foreign body. Uh, dislodging an impacted foreign body can be tricky, as I would show in my case three. And utmost care has to be taken to save the macula as much as possible. Now, intraocular foreign, I mean foreign body forceps uh, for removing uh, non-magnetic foreign bodies. We now have excellent foreign bodies, th uh, foreign body forceps. This forceps has been designed by our own uh, Dr. Manish uh, Bapai. It's called the claw IOFB removal forceps. Other than that, we have other intraocular forceps and various types of magnets. Now, following the uh, removal, a thorough peripheral vitrectomy has been done. A uh, complete removal of the posterior haloid has to be uh, should be made, and uh, in if there's an associated RD, a complete vitrectomy followed by management of the RD is done. Uh, retinal periphery, as you have seen, uh, thorough examination of the periphery is to be done and uh, tamponade can be either with gas or uh, oil as you require. Concomitant cataracts has to be dealt with. Uh, I would now go to case two. Uh, this is a, a glass foreign body has been, th as the history has been uh, given by the patient, there was a glass blast injury. Now the vitrectomy, uh, the uh, overlying vitreous hemorrhage has been cleared. We are trying to see the impaction site. The retina is incarcerated into the site of impaction. As you can see, there is a uh, retinal detachment. So the retina is, we are trying to free the retina from the impaction site. For that, we might have to do a little bit of retinectomy as well as retinotomy. I'm trying to find the glass shard inside. Repeatedly, we are trying to find the glass shard, but we couldn't. It has it is impacted so deep that there's always a fear of uh, uncontrollable hemorrhage if we dig further. So hemostasis is being achieved with cautery. Mm -hmm. We were not able to get the foreign body there, but as we know that it was glass, you know, for all practical purposes, it will be inert. So we left it at that followed by laser and oil injection. After three months of silicon oil removal, the uh, best corrected visual equity was 1.22 lot mark. We'll come to case number three. Here is a, an intraocular metallic foreign body. Uh, this surgery has been uh, done by another co-instructor who had just spoken before me, Dr. Subendu Baral. Uh, again, there's a huge amount of uh, vitreous hemorrhage, which was cleared. The site of impaction has been approached now. Just very near to the fovea. Again, the retina is was a little in, in, uh, incarcerated. Uh, he's trying to free the retina. So s there's a small animation to trying to explain what exactly had happened. The foreign body seems to be quite deeply impacted into it, into the uh, retina. He had converted the right, uh, right port into a 20G1 because the magnet goes inside. Yeah, mm -hmm. now you can see that uh, in, in, in spite of trying hard, he couldn't, uh, disimpact the foreign body. So what he does is give some relaxing incisions to take the foreign body out.
now with these deep uh, scleral incisions. And after a little bit of struggling, he could finally achieve to get the foreign body out. Yeah, and see what a huge size that is. Now another challenge is to take that foreign body out of the eye. So he enlarges an incision. See, he is holding the foreign body with the magnet in his right hand. Then he changes his hand, keeps a ma another magnet in his left hand, increases the incision further, and then he can nudge the foreign body out. That is about six millimeters long and three millimeters wide. Well, after that, it's pretty much routine. Fluid air exchange followed by oil. This is after one month, and after three months with glue diural, was the vision improved to Logmar 0.2. So the new tools in the management of macular foreign body, what we have now are high brightness xenon light source, chandelier light source, so that you can use both your hands, and a wide angle binocular indirect microscope, ophthalmoscope. Non-contact viewing system helps, a biome helps, in having an increased vision. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandul. Uh, um, in your patients, uh, in those patients where you don't have that many, that big foreign bodies, do you feel that doing a laser before removal is uh, more practical because sometimes you can have a significant hemorrhage yes, while yes. removal? It does, it does. Be if, if, if your foreign body is smaller and you can assess or you have already assessed the size of your foreign body with your imaging before preoperative, then it's better that you laser first and then you remove. But again, if the impaction is quite deep, then you might have to extend. Yeah. Uh, until unless you have a uh, tractional thing. Yeah. Any specific uh, uh, indication where you remove through the cornea or through the sclera or you feel that whatever is comfortable? Uh, I think that if you uh, if the if you have a clear lens and the foreign body is small, then uh, it you can keep the lens intact if you are sure that you are not going to touch the lens while removal, or if you uh, if you are confident that yeah if you are confident that you can't you won't touch the uh, even if it touches then you can change your surgery you can have a, a cataract after that, but if you feel that the size is quite large or there is already a cataract. Then you keep the patient affected, you remove it, remove it from the anterior segment, and then you can have a glue diural as in the second case Secondary later procedure. on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well taken. Uh, I think we'll uh, go ahead with the uh, next presentation with Dr. Rupak Rai. So we'll have, uh, we'll get a few nuances of how you manage a macular hole retinal attachment. So thank Rai, you, Sudipto and AIOC. I'll be speaking on macular hole with retinal attachment. So retinal attachment with macular hole can be seen uh, in the context of retinal attachment with macular hole with peripheral breaks, retinal attachment with macular hole in highly myopic eyes. So uh, retinal attachment in seen in macular hole with peripheral breaks uh, in uh, the patients we find high myopia in around one third of cases and usually there is a complete vitreous detachment. RD in high myopic eyes, usually the RD is shallow there is limited detachment, uh, vitromacular additions, and usually no peripheral breaks. So uh, the surgical approach is basically uh, the same as you do for other retinal attachments, complete vitrectomy with PVD induction. We should avoid drainage through the macular hole because it increases the chance of damage to the RP, and peeling gives a better functional outcome uh, as compared to uh, no peeling techniques. So I'll share two uh, videos to highlight two techniques. Basically, one is the PFCL assisted and one is without uh, PFCL. So uh, this is the first video. Uh, this is an older video. You can see first, obviously, the steps remain the same, that you do a complete vitrectomy. And then you inject PFCL, uh, over, the, uh, PFCL over the macular area. 
gently over the posterior fold no need to get a full uh, pfcl uh, fill and uh, then what we do in this cases is we can uh, inject our blue around the pfcl here i am injecting uh, the trypan uh, the brilliant blue around the pfcl uh, normally uh, if you should be careful inject within the bubble sometimes if you inject directly there can be some sort of isogenic damage so injecting at the edge of the pfcl helps and then uh, you should uh, start the peeling process no need to remove the pfcl before you peel first you should uh, get a good grasp of the ilm as has been mentioned earlier in this cases uh, the problem is there is uh, no counter traction so peeling might be a little uh, difficult as compared to what we do in a normal macular hole cases ideally it should be started uh, from the from the nasal side or where you get the better staining here i have started from the inferior nasal part and i am starting the peeling under the pfcl and i could get a flap here once you get a flap when this video is recorded the concept of uh, inverse ilm peeling was not there nowadays people have reported inverse ilm peeling also in cases of macular hole with retinal detachment so in this cases what we have done is basically uh, peel throughout around the around the hole so as to get a, a good closure of the macular hole you can see i am able to peel through the pfcl bubble around the hole and get a complete peel so this is the first case where we have done a PFCL uh, assisted uh, macular hole uh, ILM peeling. I'll go to the next case. This is a case where we have a retinal detachment with a macular hole. The steps are essentially similar as we'll do in any case of uh, retinal detachment surgery. Uh, first is a PVD induced, uh, <coughs> uh, IVT induced uh, PVD induction, which uh, is relatively easy in this case. As you see, I'm able to get a good grasp of the PVD and the PVD is nicely induced. After the PVD induction, there can be two steps. Some surgeons would prefer injecting directly uh, the brill uh, brilliant blue over the retina and some people might do a fluid air exchange uh, and then inject the brilliant blue. Both techniques are good, but personally I do it with a fluid air exchange because I feel the uh, staining is better with uh, with the help of a uh, fluid air exchange so uh, um, after the complete vitrectomy i did a fluid air exchange and uh, yeah this is the start of the peeling as we have mentioned earlier if we peel from the nasal side it is better because you get a hinge of the optic disc where the retina is firmly attached the difficulty here is uh, there is the retina is very mobile the underneath the retina is very mobile so the peeling can be challenging because the retina is lifting along with the peel but there are various problems with pfcs like it can migrate through the macular hole it can uh, there can be retained pfcl and there is another extra step of removing the pfcl so personally i feel uh, doing under saline is the best option though it can be a little challenging but it gives better results uh, Thank you for very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Uh, any question from the audience? Dr. Roy, one uh, query, uh, uh, in high myopes where you have a macular hole RD, especially loculated posterior fluid, uh, so how do you drain that fluid through the macular hole when it's quite thick and viscous? Mm. So sometimes in very high myopic cases, if there is a macular hole with RD, I, tend to, I can drain through the macular hole with a soft tip because otherwise that fluid tends to take a very long time to go away. Dr. Mundal, any anything to add? So we'll go ahead with the last presentation by Dr. Krishnendu Nondi. Dr. Nondi will be presenting on this high myops, uh, the macular skysis with subretinal fluid, the tips and tricks uh, in managing these patients surgically. Yeah, thank you and thank you for the opportunity by Shudipto for giving me the talk on myopic uh, traction maculopathy. This a myopic maculopathy means big eye, big problem with us. So uh, there are a lot of pathogenesis regarding that on uh, foveal traction and maculopathy. So pathogenesis may be due to the contraction of the posterior hyoid, 
or the epithelial membrane formation is the cause of traction maculopathy or it may, it may be the retinal vascular traction the small retinal vessel cause traction and give rise to skysis formation rigidity of ilm is another point and posterior staphyloma is another point what leads to development of foveal skysis traction maculopathy so it can um, lead uh, to foveal skysis lamellar macular hole formation full thickness macular hole formation subretinal fluid formation or retinal detachment complete so there are a lot of uh, classification upon uh, the classification of myopic uh, traction maculopathy this is the classification proposed by barbara parolini et al in 2020 so we have treatment for few cases of traction maculopathy uh, sometimes it resolves by its own it can natural recovery or we have treatment as vitrectomy with ilm filling macular buckling is another option and supracordial buckling is another option so what is the indication of surgery in these cases mainly the foveal detachment full thickness macular is the second point third point is macular hole with along with the retinal detachment and sometimes if the foveal skysis is progressing with a gradual loss of vision so difficulty with open phase is a long elongated axial length which is the main uh, difficult part of the doing surgery and we cannot reach sometimes to the posterior pole we have to make some adjustment in order to reach the posterior pole now ilm filling in these cases are very they are very tricky because they are very thin sticky cannot come out by its own we sometimes can come out piece by piece So what is the difference between the idiopathic macular hole and myopic macular hole the conventional surgery in idiopathic macular hole closure rate is very high around 90 to 100% but myopic macular hole closure rate is very low 60 to 90% so we may have to modify our surgery not doing a regular peeling but go ahead with the inverted peeling sometimes so surgical tips we have to keep your port wide apart not to the superior at uh, around 9 o'clock 3 o'clock position multiple staining is required in order to see the vitreous properly and do proper pvd induction bbg dye has to be given multiple times in order to stain the ilm because of lack of contrast from the myopic retina foveal spare in ilm peeling is required in cases of only foveal skysis without any macular hole ilm flap is a better choice than the conventional ilm peeling in macular hole surgeries and wide dissection of ilm required at least to the area of the posterior staphyloma as gas tamponade gives better result why because it will cover the uh, posterior staphyloma properly rather than the oil so inverted ilm peeling plays a significant role in this kind of cases where the posterior staphyloma is there and uh, very difficult to close this kind of macular hole in a normal conventional peeling technique sometimes in spite of doing inverted ilm peeling we have to use the viscoelastic perfluorocarbon in order to make it stay till the afg is done so if you can see the study you can see the myopic macular hole only flap technique and peeling the flap technique and peeling technique there is a lot of difference in outcome so it suggests that if you want to do peeling in cases of macular hole uh, with rd or without rd in myopic patient inverted flap technique gives a better result so other techniques also has been described like many things is like a dustbin you can do whatever you want to peel and peel it and plug it in the dustbin of macular hole it should not be done actually flap is better method so anterior posterior segment capsular flap can be used autologous transplantation of ilm is also described thrombin is also described the autologous blood autologous neurosensory retinal flap amniotic membrane graft lot of things have been tried in order to close the myopic macular hole so coming to macular hole retinal retinal detachment is a different ball game altogether you have to induce the pvd pvd induction is difficult ilm peeling becomes difficult in this kind of cases so is a case of counting finger 3 meter vision with a foveal detachment with a macular hole so the peripheral retina is attached you can see the demarcated area of detachment with a central macular hole we proceed with the surgery after doing core vitrectomy we need to stain the vitreous with the transcellular acetonide 
so transferrin acetonide see i am filling with the helping of the soft tip in order to create a plane in the poster highlight in order to make a complete induction of pvd so gradually i have succeeded to induce the pvd as it is very sticky adherent to the retina and using the soft tip cannula to induce the pvd you can use the forceps also whatever you are comfortable with so after inducing pvd is a routine case then using uh, fg and then putting the dye why i have used fg because to make a greater staining of ilm rather than un putting a bg under uh, only saline so, so i have started ilm filling it is a conventional technique not the ilm flap so i need to peel the ilm up to the edge of the subretinal fluid which is there in the posterior pole so my aim is to peel as much as possible as i am not doing the inverted flap technique so i am proceeded with the peeling as much as possible up to the edge of the subretinal fluid at the posterior pole so after adequate peeling i'll do fg and put cast so this is the outcome after 6 weeks vision has improved but you can notice there is a very thin fovea so we do not expect much better outcome in this kind of cases so other things also described like a uh, posterior buckle macular buckle so i don't have any personal experience of that but it has a lot of complication it has a steep learning curve also in order to settle this kind of macular buckle can be used in a very deep seated eye very long eye where posterior staphyloma is quite large where your instrument you think your instrument cannot reach up to the posterior pole so this is a sample which has been published by Dr. Pradeep. There is a macular hole detachment in the posterior pole with a subretinal fluid, both cases, and it has been quite tackled well enough with a macular buckle. So to conclude, it's a very difficult scenario for the any VR surgeon. Inverse flap, if you are going inside, inverse flap gives you better result. If the axial length is more than 30, deep seated posterior pole, posterior staphyloma it gives you a better poor prognostic outcome even if you close the hole or settle the rate the visual outcome is very bad thank you thank you dr nundi uh, i think one one very difficult situation sometimes happens when you have a very long axial length and to drain that subretinal fluid so dr nundi you want to comment on this yeah very difficult <laughs> very difficult to reach at the posterior pole sometimes the soft tip cannula gives you extra length where with which you can draw the fluid or sometimes you need to take out the cannula the trocar cannula itself in order to give you some extra length to introduce the yes. forcep or fluid whichever you have so that is the technique you can modify with you yeah that was what i was going to ask you what yeah. are the tips yeah. for so uh, either you use yeah. soft tip cannula or you take out the trocar and uh, use your instrument through the sclera itself Right, and uh, sometimes even after that, you will find that you will not, yeah. you are not able to t take that last bit yes. of uh, 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 water out. Yes. Last bit of fluid out. Yes. Now, sometimes what I have uh, tried is I have tried to change my hands, mm. and uh, from my right hand to I have uh, tried to go to through the left hand, and sometimes it is possible uh, to enter from the other way around. Uh, so that actually if you access to the uh, to with the eye uh, with the hand where you actually access the yes. macular closure yes 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 so i think that's so one, if one you part. change the hand and then you take the trocar out and you go straight away without the without the trocar i mean cannula then you purchase that extra amount of yes. uh, uh, length that he was referring to do do phobia sparing yes definitely island. in island filling with uh, macular only subretinal fluid with macular sciasis, foveal sciasis, I do prefer to <laughs> do uh, um, foveal sparing alum filling because 
otherwise you will deroof the and you will iatrogenic cause the macular hole formation later on even if you have done a uh, foveal sparing the patient can still end up having macular hole in future right. so that can be counseled to the patient that uh, you can need constant follow up yeah mm. thank you so much uh, and thank you so much audience for the for your attendance and uh, any 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 question any last question otherwise we will close the session thank you so much thank you my co instructors for the session thank you so much thank you. Okay, okay. Only three of us are there.